songs I know. <laughs> well, just wing it. <laughs> and you all get your hymnal. It'll be fun. And we, they don't even know what they're singing yet, so they're hoping it's uh, good. It's number... <laughs> number 489 is where we start out today. And... Uh, Let's, uh, let's sing some sunshine songs this morning. How's that? Uh, Heavenly Sunlight, 489. Let's sing until I tell us to stop singing. Stand up, uh, 489. <laughs> Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep vale. Jesus has said I there for a moment. Daniel told me he didn't know this song. But he's playing the right song. This is wrong. <laughs> we sing it a little different, Daniel. Oh, okay. But it's good enough, except we do sing it faster. Okay. <laughs> on the second verse. There we go. Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, hit it on the second verse. <laughs> the shadows above me never conceal my singer and God. Oops. The light in him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, putting my soul in glory divine. I'm a joy rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. We're learning. We're learning the version you're playing. On the third. Here we go. <laughs> the sunlight of rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Sinners' faces, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. I am rejoicing. His praises, Jesus is mine. There's the new version of Heavenly Sunlight. It's the Yankee version. It's the Yankee version. That's it. Uh, now next, uh, what's the next one on there? Uh, 619, uh, turn uh, in your hymnal. Just remain standing there, 619. And uh, we will uh, sing another sunshine song, which is uh, Sunshine in My Soul. soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky, for Jesus is my light, oh, there's sunshine in my soul, blessed sunshine in my soul, when the peaceful, happy moments, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling there is sunshine in my soul on the second. There is music in my soul today for a carol to my King. And Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine in my soul. Peaceful. shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. None the last. There is gladness in my soul today. And hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now. For joys laid up above. Oh, this sunshine blesses us. Shows his smiling face. 
There is sunshine in my soul. Amen. Musicians, you may be seated. Congregation as well. And uh, thanks, uh, Daniel and uh, singers, uh, getting us started off with a little bit of a smile this morning. And uh, let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for... Uh, the fact that we see the smile of Jesus sometimes in the face of others, in the face of uh, the Word, in our own, uh, own hearts and uh, with spiritual eyes. And we're grateful this morning that there's a sweet fellowship in this place. And uh, we're grateful for these who have come a long distance or uh, live right here local, for those who join us online as well for a little bit of study that we pray is a blessing. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And welcome back this morning as we uh, look at uh, the mysteries of the pyramids. Uh, a couple of things I would uh, remind you of. If you haven't signed up for lunch tomorrow, there's a uh, sign-up sheet uh, back there. If you would like to have lunch uh, with us, you can, uh, you can either pay Brenda sometime or you can uh, uh, whenever you want. We'll, we'll find you. We'll find you. Uh, and uh, take care of that uh, if you want to uh, join us in lunch tomorrow. And um, I, you know, I must be getting away from my Baptist roots because I forgot to mention the offering last night. It, anathema, isn't it? <laughs> we have a box back there for those who are uh, here. All of the offering. Uh, through uh, the conference will go to our building fund here. And uh, this building, many of you are from out of town, this building is about, uh, what, 80 years old, something like that, this portion of the building anyway. And uh, it was built uh, out of mud bricks by uh, members of uh, the church that wanted a building for God. And so they got some mud and made bricks with straw and uh, stacked them up on each other. And then they put a little plaster on the outside of it. And they went to the forest and uh, uh, hand, hand hewn, is that the word? The logs uh, right here from the Kit Carson National Forest and put those up there and put the boards and put uh, originally some dirt on top. We've uh, added uh, over the years a little metal roof over the top of that. Uh, but uh, uh, all volunteer. You know, earlier this spring, we did some archaeological work and got down to this original platform and this original floor up here. Uh, that'll continue on one of these days. Uh, but there's lots of... Uh, both maintenance issues and uh, improvement issues that uh, could be done on our facilities. The house, by the way, uh, was uh, built in 1920, so it's now 101 years old. It was the original piece on the property that the Baptists bought to uh, uh, make a little worship place out of, and then they added this onto it, and uh, it is uh, still used today. And then, uh, what was it, John, the 50s that the uh, Fellowship Hall building was added? 54, right in that uh, area, and uh, you know, we have, uh, we painted it once since then. <laughs> Outside of that, it's pretty original, but uh, uh, so plenty of things that can be done both uh, aesthetic-wise and uh, utilitarian-wise and uh, then just uh, pure maintenance-wise to keep the things uh, going. So those of you online who don't get to come, uh, we would, uh, you, you can donate too. Oh, we have made it available for you. <laughs> TausFBC.org. That's T A O S F B C dot O R G. And if you click the donate button, everything that comes in on the online uh, gifts this weekend uh, will uh, go to that, or you can mail it in to 220 Paseo del Pueblo Norte, Taos, New Mexico, 87571. That's 220 Paseo del Pueblo Norte, Taos, New Mexico, 87571. Now, back to our program. <laughs> uh, and uh, the book, I would remind you again before we get uh, back into it, the book is available back there, $12. Those of you online, it's dispensationalpublishing.com, $12.95. And uh, uh, I, I have uh, studied uh, diligently the first two, there's basically four chapters of the book, uh, rather lengthy chapters. The first two chapters are the information I've been sharing uh, with you uh, as the uh, foundational portion of where I got my information. The, the last two chapters, which I'm not really going into, are the two chapters in which uh, Dr. Seiss uh, 
deals with objections because in this day and in that day, there of course were objections and uh, he deals with those and uh, pulls out uh, you know, some of the more uh, scientific aspects of uh, what is going on and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the various objections that obviously would be given. And so if you'd like to dig into it more, you can go to that. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, do a little bit of uh, review here this morning uh, as uh, we get started. And uh, here's, a, here's a picture that I thought uh, was, uh, was, was helpful to remind you, just give you a little visual of what we discovered last night, that the Earth's axis became a uh, measurement really of, uh, of two things. One of the, as it's called here, sacred cubits, that is the cubit in the Bible, that uh, you can take the measurement of the uh, radius of the axis, which is mirrored in the radius of the temple, and uh, you get uh, 10,000 sacred cubits. Now, I would remind you, and it's not really on this picture, but uh, the metric system is, uh, I'm gonna use this line right here, as if Paris is right here, the metric system takes uh, this uh, half of the, uh, here's the equator, so it takes half of a meridian, a quarter portion of uh, the world, if you will, and divides that by 10. Now remember, the challenge there is that the world, uh, the earth uh, kind of changes its size right there, so it's kind of hard to get any kind of um, uh, anything that's accurate, but take the radius, divide by 10,000, you have the sacred cubit, and how many inches is that? 25 inches, yes. Uh, so if you take the radius of the earth, divide by 10,000, you'll come up with 25.025 inches, I believe it is. Uh, the inch that we have is to take the diameter, use that 500 million unit that we talked about last night because the pyramid is so rife with fives uh, to take it and divide it by 500 million. And uh, that comes to what we, what we call the, the pyramid inch. Some people call it the... Uh, I believe the, the term they use is the earth-based inch. And uh, they use that earth-based inch so that, uh, uh, be because it's uh, based on the earth. Now remember, the pyramid inch or the earth-based inch, I'm gonna move those in case they're blocking your view there. Not of me, but of the screen. Uh, but uh, the earth-based inch is one one-thousandth of an inch different than the uh, English inch that we use today, which is based upon your thumb. So, they say, uh, a little bit of uh, review. Now, we talked about squaring the circle. I bring this up because I didn't put the picture up last night, uh, but it's a picture that uh, is helpful to understand what uh, all of that means. Here is the dimensions of the Great Pyramid right here. You can look at it really in two ways. You can look at it as you would from the side view, or if you were looking from the top, it would look like, uh, like this with the four sides of the pyramid and here being the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the top of the pyramid. You've got the axis of the pyramid is of the exact proportions that it takes that if this became the radius of a circle using pi, which is all built into here, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the never-ending number of pi, uh, which really is, if you look at pi and study it a little bit, and this gets above my head real quick, but if you look pi and study it a little bit, it is the number that uh, is the key to the universe. You, you, you can't study geometry and you can't study uh, spatial issues and, pi and, and uh, the universe without studying pi. So it's built in here to uh, the dimensions. You've got the 3.1415, uh, 14159, whatever it is. Uh, you've got uh, all of that built into the dimensions here. So if you then take this as the radius uh, and uh, then use that, pi r squared, right? Uh, to get the circumference, the circumference of the circle is exactly the same as the perimeter of the square. That is, as Wikipedia told us last night, impossible to come up with with your regular compass and ruler. You're never going to get there. Uh, and yet, here's one that uh, 4,000 plus years ago got there. And they, made, uh, they, they were able to square the circle, if you will, because, as we said, our premise was the pyramid 
shouts out all of the details, the scientific details of our earth, just like our scriptures shout out uh, the details of the uh, redemption, redemptive work of God. Now, here's some things that uh, I just bring up. It's a, it's a list of things that uh, we won't go into, but some things that I didn't include that I just thought, that's kind of interesting stuff that you can take and you can chew on it. It's not in your notes here, but uh, some interesting measurement. Number one, the breadth of the king's chamber equals half its length. Okay, that's not all that exciting, is it? Uh, but what I, the reason I want to go through this list is to say one of them alone is not all that interesting. But over and over and over again, you see that there really is nothing left to chance in this building, that it all had such amazing architecture that when you go into the pyramid, and have, have, some of you have been there, right? Uh, we've got uh, several, uh, three or four or five that have been uh, to the pyramid. I haven't. I'd like to go someday. Um, I don't know if I ever will, because I don't think you can drive there. Uh, but uh, I think you all would agree with me. When you go into the pyramid, unlike some other buildings that you go into, it doesn't shout all this stuff out. You go in and you, uh, uh, I, I don't have any interior pictures, uh, you can look them up easily on the internet. Uh, you know, you say, well, it's kind of cool to be in the pyramid. And there's, there's, there's this long hallway and this long hallway goes to the room at the end. And, uh, you know, all oh, this one gets a little bigger than the other ones. But it, this stuff is not shouted out. Like, I think, when you go into other pyramids, you're going to say, this was a king's burial chamber. Ah, you know, look at the, look at the hieroglyphics on the wall. There's no hieroglyphics on the wall. There's no writing on the wall. There's no, there's no testimony that's given. There's no treasures uh, oozing forth. And so you look at it and you, you really, I think, would say, what's the use of this thing? That is, it's, it, there, there's better burial chambers. What, what's the use of this thing? And, uh, and, and yet only when you begin to be diligent. Remember, uh, remember one of our favorite scriptures, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, the first word says what? Study. <laughs> Study to show thyself approved. A workman who had no need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is one of those uh, things that if you want a spectacular pyramid, you could probably go into others more for, the, for the visuals of it. There's, there's probably other pyramids that are better. But none of those will give testimony, like this will give testimony, of all these intricate measurements. This is the one that is the engineer's delight. This is the one that's the mathematician's delight. Uh, and so all of these things, let's just uh, run through them. The breadth of the king's chamber equals half its height. The height of the king chambers, uh, king's chamber equals half the diagonal of its floor. The length of the granite portion of the antechamber, as you're going in, uh, floor, is equal to half the breadth of the king's chamber. The length of the granite portion of the antechamber floor, multiplied by five, a special pyramid number, equals the solid cubic diagonal of the king's chamber. Don't you wish we'd go through these in detail? <laughs> Showing all of these things. Uh, again, it, it, uh, it almost begins to boggle the mind as you look at this and say, Wow, somebody loved their measuring tape when they were going through this. And there, again, was such an intricate plan that literally anything you measure in the, uh, in the Great Pyramid of Giza is going to, uh, going, to, going to shout out, this was planned out. This was not accidental. Uh, a few more. Number five, the length of the granite portion of the antechamber floor multiplied by 50 equals the length of the side of a square, the area of which equals the area of a triangle of the shape and size of a pyramid's right section. Did you get that? Uh, again, somebody really had to think through this. Could all of this be accidental? No, you know, you might come if you're building a building today, you might say, well, you know, I want it to be 10 by 12, 12 by 14, whatever. And uh, that uh, would uh, come out and you say, okay, there it is, it's, uh, it's planned. But I doubt you would do much planning on the height other than to say, I can buy an eight foot board or I can buy a 10 foot board and I don't want to cut board and I don't want to waste board, there it is. And, uh, and, and you would uh, begin to go with that on the gables of the roof. You say, okay, I just want to make sure that uh, the snow falls off and it doesn't uh, cave in the roof 
roof and all those kind of things that you would consider, but it would be uh, a very mundane kind of, uh, and, and you wouldn't really care if this portion matched that portion and if this angle shouted out something. But here, again, I think you could, uh, uh, you could spend a lifetime studying all of these uh, various angles. Number six, the length of the king's chamber multiplied by 25, a pyramid cubit, equals and even 100 times the length of the antifloor's granite floor. That's inspiring, isn't it? Let's go on. <laughs> uh, interesting measurements. If the length of the granite portion of the antichamber floor is multiplied by an even 100, and this length is taken to express the diameter of a circle, the arc of that circle will be found to equal the arc of the square base of the pyramid. There's a lot of uh, chance going on in this. Isn't there? That's too much to say, ah, it's chance. It's, it's uh, like, uh, who is the philosopher that said, uh, you know, there must be a watchmaker. <laughs> if, uh, th this watch is too complicated. Somebody has to be behind it. Number eight, the height of the antechamber multiplied by an even 100 equals the base side of the length plus the vertical height of the pyramid. Not only did it take someone a long time to plan this, it took someone a long time to discover this because there was not a user's guide when you, uh, when you, when you come in. Uh, and uh, furthermore, I may say this uh, later uh, also, but we said last night that the, uh, the pyramid was encased. The casing is gone now, and now you see the rough masonry that was underneath. Uh, it was encased. Uh, I did look it up uh, because I, last night I, I said marble. It's actually not marble. It was limestone. Uh, it was polished limestone. Uh, which they, they believe would have uh, uh, basically glowed in the dark, uh, had enough shine of the sun in the daytime and at the night, and then the capstone, they believe, probably covered in gold. So this was a stunning building when you come up upon it uh, in its day. And let me add to this, they covered the entrance with the limestone. The entrance that we have now was not visible down through the years. That means all of these very particular measurements, nobody went in to see it. It was all buried, basically, uh, built in, covered up. Uh, why would you do that? Except that maybe this is a memorial somewhere. You know, uh, sometimes we, we put, uh, I don't know, a time capsule or something like that, or even within a building, we'll put a cornerstone. We'll talk about cornerstones later. We'll put a cornerstone, and uh, inside that cornerstone, you know, it's hollowed out, and you put... Uh, I don't know, the blueprints and uh, who the building committee was and, uh, uh, you know, the newspaper article from that day or whatever it is, uh, a lock of your hair. I don't know what you put in those things. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and you seal it up as a testimony to the future saying someday they're going to get in this, they're going to open this up, and it'll be kind of uh, cool. They'll, they'll, they'll know who we were and uh, a, a few things about us. It, it's almost like the entire pyramid is a time capsule. Shut up to say, we want to have a testimony of some things that we knew, if nothing else. Number nine, the antechamber length multiplied by 50 equals the vertical height of the pyramid. Now, again, there's nine things, not included in your notes, nine things that just say uh, there's uh, something stunning going on here uh, in uh, what we've got. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, pick up on the notes here and a little bit of reminder of what we've learned. We uh, learn that the pyramid seems to know and to shout out that the earth itself is a sphere. Seems to know that. Seems to know that the earth is on an axis and things are going to spin around that axis even at a particular rate uh, they're going to rotate and revolve at a certain distance around the sun and at a certain rate. So uh, we looked at uh, last night, if you, uh, uh, what, uh, take the, uh, the side and multiply it by 10 to the 9th, uh, if I got this right, uh, you end up with the distance to the sun. And uh, the length of that side being 365.2422, uh, was it, or 2522, uh, the exact uh, time that it's going to take to revolve around this uh, 90, I'm going to say, I'm going to round it out to 94 million miles uh, away from the sun. The pyramid seems to know this stuff. 
Either that or it's an amazing accident, right, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that they've got this. Uh, the, the pyramid seems to know where the poles were. The North Pole and the South Pole seem to understand this concept. And the ability to set within the margin of error for one half the distance between the equator and the North Pole, where we talked about last night, that uh, where, where this is set, halfway between the equator, the North Pole, boom, there it is. They see, it seems to know this. Otherwise, it was, a, a, once again, a great big cosmic accident. But they just wanted it right there. Uh, going on. Uh, as close as possible, it seems to know, the geographic center of the Earth's inhabited land mass. Now, we did not discuss this last night. Uh, Larkin has a picture uh, that kind of uh, brings this up. If you just look up uh, Clarence Larkin Pyramid and then go to the images, uh, you'll probably find his stuff on there. And, and, and he has some writings on this as well. Uh, and he points out that the pyramid roughly at... 30 degrees north, 30 degrees west. There's a little bit of give there, and actually if you uh, uh, give by uh, probably uh, half a mile, uh, if you look at that, uh, a lot of people have studied why isn't it exactly at 30 and 30? Uh, and what they have discovered is exactly at 30 and 30 is not the right place to be. It needs to be off just a little bit and up a little bit. Again, we won't go into the detail of that. but at least for that part of uh, the, the inhabited part of the world. We're not including the two poles, whatnot, but the inhabited part of the world, this is the geographic center. You know we have our annual retreat in Branson, Missouri. Why in Branson, Missouri? Because it's in the middle of everybody. You know, 500 miles from anybody. That's what I used to say when I lived in the panhandle of Texas. I said, we're right in the center of great fishing. 500 miles any direction. You can have, you, you can have great fishing. Uh, now, that pyramid really is, if, if, if the inhabited earth at that point is going to come to it, really all through, say, biblical history, if they're going to come see this thing, that's the place to put it right there uh, because it's uh, going to be right in the center of where they are. Uh, it seems to know as close as possible uh, the, uh, let's see, I already said that. It seems to know, uh, to, it, it seems to be set to a true degree of north so as to be better than any other structure. There were many structures down through the ages, uh, pagan temples, Christian churches, that tried to build either to the east or to the north, typically were the two directions. And you go back and look at all those ancient structures, and they kind of got it, but not close. It was north-ish. This, more than any, any uh, ancient building, certainly, got it right on target. That's the true north. It seemed to know this is the true north. Again, uh, some uh, 4,000 plus years ago. Uh, seems to know the distance from the earth to the sun, as we have uh, already talked about. Now, with all of that... Uh, chronology. There's some things that uh, it uh, seems to know about chronology. Uh, it speaks of the year, as we've already said, 365.2522 years. But it also has an announcement within it. It has this mechanism within it, and uh, I'll try to explain it here. It has a mechanism within it that enables us to discover when it was built. Now, there's some assumptions that will go on, but it kind of gives a testimony, a twofold testimony to say, this is when we put this thing here. Uh, and it, uh, it, it gives this announcement in such a way that there is very much a precision uh, beyond which you could get really in any other way. What are we talking about here? Uh, you may know there is this equinox year or solar year. That's the solar year is... Does anyone want to guess how many days? You got it. 365 and a quarter days. That's the solar year. But if you begin to study it, of course, you know there is this thing uh, called the uh, sidereal. Did I pronounce it right? I, every time I look at it, I want to say sidereal. It's uh, sider si sidereal, I believe, is the, pro the proper pronunciation. A sidereal year. Now, the, 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 uh, there's, a, there's a few different numbers on the internet, but they're all fairly close. A, a, a solar year versus a sidereal year are about 20 minutes apart. 
for, so the, for, the, for the most part, we don't worry about it. Now, what in the world is a sidereal year? Uh, anyone have a great way to explain it? I figured, uh, you know, what's that? <laughs> yes, I do, I do, yes. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> but I am going to try to explain it best I can. I want to make sure I did not put a picture up. Uh, no, I did not. Uh, so there's, there's some pictures you can get on the internet that might help. There's some videos. I couldn't find a three-minute video or I would have shown you one. So I'm going to try to do in three minutes what takes a 30-minute video to do. Uh, but it's actually a fairly simple concept. It's just that we're not thinking, most of us, we're not into astronomy and we're not thinking of this exactly. Uh, but if you were to look into the night sky right now uh, at a particular point in the night sky, you would look. In fact, uh, Daniel and I got out last night and uh, this, this, you know, we got this full moon kind of thing almost uh, going on, so it's not the best for stargazing, but we were able to look up there and, okay, there's the Milky Way, it's right over there. It's, uh, it's moved, uh, you know, uh, a fair, fair degree uh, from even, uh, you know, two weeks ago when it was a little more over here. But nonetheless, on this particular night, if you look and you look up and uh, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, you can see... Uh, uh, Draconis. We'll talk about Draconis. You can see Draconis in the night sky right now, the dragon, the snake that's going across. Uh, you see him up there, and you say, okay, it's exactly, you know, here, and, you know, get out your, all your measurements, and you, you say, Put, exactly right there. That's where it is. Now, one sidereal day going to turn around, let's say it's at 10 o'clock, you see it right there, one sidereal day, you're going to come back around, and you're going to look, and guess what? It's going to be slightly different. And it is going to take, we'll get the number, the, the oh my, that's my granddaughter. <laughs> it is going to uh, take uh, a little bit over 28,000 years until that star will be in the, that exact place at that exact moment because the rotation of the earth in a 24-hour period is just a little bit off and we're moving in relation to that. So uh, a sidereal year gets back to approximately that place, uh, uh, but uh, it, here it is right here, 25,860 years is the cycle. Now, let's come to that in just a moment. Because we know about this, we're able to pinpoint exactly where stars were in the night sky at any moment in history. We, we, we have this scientifically down that we can go back and say, okay, you pick the time, you pick the day, they can tell you exactly what the perspective was where the stars were. If the pyramid is a type of the universe, it should know this sidereal issue, not just the solar issue, but, uh, and, and the solar issue is where are we in relation to one particular star called the sun. The sidereal issue is where are we in, in uh, relation to the other stars. It takes 25,860 years for that 20 minute a year difference to match back up again to make the full cycle. Uh, maybe we should start uh, aging ourselves based on sidereal years. <laughs> uh, we are still very young, aren't we? As a matter of fact, if you take a young Earth position, obviously we haven't even made a sidereal year uh, all the way through. The sum of the pyramid inches in the diagonal measurements of the base of the period of the pyramid is 25,860. Comes to that exact number. That's measuring those uh, and adding, uh, adding all those up. You come to 25,860. That, well, that's, that's coincidence, right? <laughs> and it's coincidence that you got the size of 365.2522 and all this is just coincidence, right? It's just way too much coincidence that that absolutely aligns with what we know of our universe today. And uh, for a long time, we didn't know of that in the universe. Now, I'm going to venture out, uh, most, most of the weekend I've been venturing out in material that I had never known before, which is what you, may, what you call going where angels fear to tread. 
you know, we preachers like to be the expert before we bring it out. Uh, and I have learned that if you wait till you're the expert before you bring it out, you are never going to bring it out. So uh, just start and uh, go with it uh, and uh, do it. I remember my sister once, she teaches music in schools, and one year, one year she got... Uh, assigned, uh, this was very early on in her, in her career, actually, she was uh, teaching at uh, Santa Fe High School. She was a demon, <laughs> not a dot. Um, and uh, uh, now she's on, I don't know, getting close to 30 years of teaching, but uh, uh, they assigned her to teach guitar, but she doesn't know how to play the guitar. Uh, and I remember her saying, I just have to be one step ahead of them. That's all. One lesson ahead of them, and I'm good. Uh, now, I, I think that uh, there's, there is some truth to, uh, you know, if we wait until we totally understand all of this, we're never going to teach any of it, uh, because there's just not that much time in life to do everything else and become an expert. So I'm, I stepped out a little bit, but I'm going to step out a little bit uh, more on this sidereal year. You know that the Earth is at a, what, 23 and a half degree uh, tilt? Um, and it, it will always be at a 23 and a half degree tilt and always has been at a 23 and a half degree tilt. There is the 23 and a half degree uh, angle within uh, where the king's chambers lines up with the uh, corner. Uh, uh, maybe I'll show you a picture of that later. It's yet another of the thousands upon thousands of angles that you could measure and say, this shouts out something. Virtually nothing you can measure in the, uh, uh, in the pyramid is there by accident it all has something to it if you can put it together it doesn't shout it out sometimes you have to you know multiply by 25 or whatever it is uh, to uh, come up with it but you'll get it there now the tilt of the earth in this sidereal process uh, changes over time what they say is that in a 25,860 year period eventually the northern hemisphere will swap with the southern hemisphere in terms of its climate. So now we have winter, of course, in the winter. <laughs> uh, and we're, 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 we just had the autumnal equinox, and we're headed into uh, the uh, winter time, and the wood's not yet chopped. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's where we're headed. And uh, do you have that problem, Bob? Your wood's chopped? That's because you're retired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, eventually, give it long enough, Lord doesn't come back, please don't give it long enough. It'll totally swap where this is coming into summer. Now, as I read that, I thought, climate change. In fact, I, I, I don't know that this is true because I only saw it one place and I wasn't able to, uh, uh, to follow that through, but it does have to do with this sidereal progression, if you will, that, that, that eventually uh, gets it on the other side where there's this change. But uh, it uh, said something about one, one degree difference in all of that over a 70-year period. I think that one degree difference over a 70-year period means that anybody who lives 70 years is going to look back and say, well, the weather used to be. And indeed, that's true. And we're looking at a season of 12 months when we need to be looking at a season of uh, however many months is in 25,860 years. That's the, that's the, uh, full, uh, uh, the full year that it uh, takes there. Now again, the exact number comes through there and uh, is shown uh, through. So uh, looking at that, uh, here's, a, here's a, a diagram of the inside again. Uh, uh, this, this diagram uh, is inverted compared to the direction that most of them are given, but I'm going to go ahead with it anyway. Uh, the, here is the, uh, the side of the pyramid. Here is the, uh, the, the, the main passage, the descending passage that's right here. We'll talk about that more later. There is a, uh, I can't read what, what that is. I, I think this is an old one. I think it says the, the Mohammedan tunnel or something like that. Uh, there were some uh, uh, Muslims that basically broke in. You can see it's kind of jagged. They worked their way in, just basically boring in, trying to find something uh, and uh, assuming that the northern entrance would be. So they bored their way in uh, there. It is not the original entrance at all. Uh, if I, I, I believe that this is the entrance that tourists use today. Uh, I may be wrong with that. Do any of you know? Uh, and, uh, okay, we got, we got Warren shaking his head yes, so I'm going to go with it. Uh, the expert in the room. 
Uh, <laughs> now, that we can pretty much ignore because it was not original part of the, uh, of the pyramid until it uh, comes to this point. Now, this, this entry they have now discovered, uh, it is now open, uh, that is the uh, original entry. Now, there is an assumption, could it be that this particular angle would point to something in the solar system that could be used to date the building? So if we were, uh, let me back up, we pretty much work on the sun. We're solar kind of people. John was talking last night about uh, the uh, kivas uh, among the uh, American Indians, how at the equinox period often made so that the uh, sun at that day is going to shine just at an exact spot in the, uh, in, in the kiva. Now, that's, uh, um, it, it's sort of, you, you say, okay, yeah, this, this sort of makes sense. Uh, if you have any regard to the sun, if you know, the, know all of these things, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not high science necessarily to be able to do that. We could figure out uh, how to do that in here, you know, if we wanted a, a, a channel that somehow would shine right on me, uh, you know, at uh, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Uh, we could figure out every Sunday how we have to uh, get that. Let's work on that with this building fund money. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we could, we could uh, figure all that out. Now... Uh, if we wanted to point it to a star, let's suppose we want to uh, point it to the North Star, which would be what? Right that, that way? Am I? That way. <laughs> uh, we wanted to point to the North Star. And our building, of course, is going to last 25,000 years, so it's no problem. And, and four or 5,000 years from now, people come and say, ah, they've got this uh, window pointed, just one window right there. What must it have been pointing to? They might say, ah, it was pointing to the North Star. Problem is, four or 5,000 years from now, our Polaris, the North Star, is not going to be the North Star anymore. There have been different North Stars down through history. You can look this up, and they'll all say, you know, the, the North Star changes. And it changes because of this perspective that we have of, the, of, the, of where we are according to the stars, and we're progressing uh, out of it. And so 25,000 years, excuse me, uh, when they built this, forget the 25, 8, uh, when they built this, if we assume they probably were pointing that thing right at the North Star. You can actually pinpoint it right down to where this would have pointed to Alpha Draconis. Alpha Draconis is a star. That was, at one point, the North Star. It will be the North Star again in about uh, 21,000 years. Uh, it will be the North Star. Now, don't worry. Polaris is going to be the North Star for the rest of your life. Uh, it's a slow, very slow progression that is uh, going to take place. But Alpha Draconis. Now, uh, Alpha is just, uh, they're, they're probably, in fact, I'm sure there was an original name for it. Uh, today, we number stars kind of like uh, COVID variants. We use, uh, we use Greek letters. And uh, so Alpha is the chief star in Draconis, the constellation Draconis. Draconis is the dragon uh, that uh, goes across the sky. I'll point them out to you tonight uh, uh, after dark. Uh, but uh, uh, he's visible in the summer months. And, it, and, and Alpha Draconis is certainly not Polaris, the North Star, today. When was it the North Star? Again, a few assumptions here. But if we go back to it, I think we can begin to uh, build the case that this points to the year 2170 B.C. That's when it would have been the perfect vantage point to point at the North Star. This building is perfectly north. It's a decent assumption. Again, they did not leave the user's guide to the pyramid uh, to tell us that this is the safe assumption. But if that's the case then this pyramid was built 2170 BC, or roughly uh, 4,040, uh, 40, uh, what, 200 years ago, uh, uh, in carrying that out, if that is a safe assumption. Now, uh, 
the interesting thing is this is that really that is about the only year you get uh, a, 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 a North Star in view. It, it, it doesn't work any other year. So you go back to that time. You say, okay, I, it's probably the year 2170 BC. Now, if that's the case, uh, let me, uh, got uh, too far back there. No, I didn't. Let me see where I am. I haven't been following my notes. Um, so, ah, yeah, okay, 2170. So yet another way this count is confirmed. That's where I am. Uh, so here we're going to go and see yet another way this count is confirmed. This one's uh, a little complicated, but kind of interesting. It seems like measurements mean something, right? Well, if you go down, this is the pathway. Again, we just we, we uh, mirrored our, our image right here. Here's the uh, pyramid, the ragged pyramid, as you can see today. You see the line that, uh, in, that uh, is the uh, point at which the original pyramid with its casing had. And right down here by number three, uh, is this passageway uh, that is given. That's the way that would have pointed to Alpha Draconis in 2170. If you go down here, roughly about a thousand inches, uh, and then you start your way up this way. Uh, and as you go in that, in that uh, upward chamber there, uh, if you go 1,542 inches, you get all the way to this grand chamber, which is number nine right here. So 1,542 inches, this is about 1,000 inches. All of that uh, together. Everybody with me so far? Uh, now, let's reverse this. Uh, let's start at the grand chamber and go back. 1,542 inches, we're gonna end up right at that intersection right there. Uh, with that then, you go up again, up uh, number three there, and uh, you go up uh, 628 inches. When you get to 628 inches, back up here, so you're not all the way, but you're at 628 inches, all of a sudden there's some uh, different stonework that is given there. Uh, the stonework, let me see if I have a picture. Yeah, this is not a good picture, but it was the best one I can get. Uh, you see this, these two lines right here, they're vertical lines. Uh, there is some stonework in which the lines right there begin to get vertical. You probably can't see these very well, but the other lines down through there uh, are of the same angle as the floor. Uh, but you get to that one point and all of a sudden those stones stand up. And there is a very neatly carved all the way around uh, line, border vertical as if to say is it really saying i don't know as if to say this marks the point at which we started to build this upward now if that's the case the interesting thing is let me go back uh, right here the interesting thing is that 1000 right here 1542 plus 648 to where there's those interesting marks on the wall happens to be 2170. So twice you get this 2170 thing coming up. Anything to it? Could, could you, it's not the most solid argument. Uh, in, the, in a court of law, they might say, ah, it's a little bit circumstantial. You're, uh, you have confirmation bias. You're looking for something too badly and you're gonna find it. There is that possibility of this, but both of those seem to point to, uh, uh, to 2170. Uh, now, that's, uh, that, that is kind of interesting because then if you begin to use that mark there as, as uh, 2,170, and then you begin to count every inch, every inch counts for a year. And what you come up with is at the end where you get this grand gallery would have been 30 A.D. Uh, excuse me. I take that back. Would have been 2 B.C. 2 B.C. is about where we believe that Jesus Christ was born. We'll talk about what happens uh, later 
if you go about another 33 inches from uh, 2 BC. Uh, so could it be that, again, there's a little bit of testimony? Now, another thing, as you're, if, if you're counting from 2170, and obviously, again, we don't have a lot of uh, sources to go on, uh, and archaeologists and historians would disagree somewhat on some dating here. Uh, but if you begin to, uh, to count the downward cycle, and then right here you can begin to come upward, that lines up with Abraham the call of Abraham, all of a sudden you don't have the dragon looking down upon you, but you're starting to move upward right there. Could it be? Now, again, uh, I wish it was uh, carved on the wall <laughs> right there, but it's at least, wouldn't you say, an interesting speculation that all of this does very much uh, uh, seem to work uh, through it all. Uh, and uh, you, you come up with that. Now, let's, uh, let's move on and let's talk about uh, the, uh, some sevens in the pyramid, just uh, incidentally, because yesterday we talked about fives in the pyramid and the, the uh, overall fiveness of the pyramid. We talked a little bit about the, the nines and the 10-9 ratio, uh, but uh, we should talk about sevens too, because seven is a very important uh, issue in the, uh, in the uh, pyramid. I, one more picture I forgot I had on this on here uh, this is from uh, many of you have it uh, the uh, uh, I think originally it was a guy named Adams who did the Adams sin chronological chart of history uh, it's been modified a, a few times uh, and this is one I happen to have uh, uh, with me and I could take a picture of it's that big chart that's like this and spreads all around the room uh, and uh, I happen to have one if uh, someone would like to purchase it <laughs> Daryl has one. Did you buy one? Not yet, on sale. Ah, yeah, you see, you should have bought it when you were in Branson. It was on sale. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one of the big one, uh, and then I have other smaller ones that is in a book form, and you, you sort of fold it out. This is actually from the book form. Uh, and uh, what, what you've got here, here's this black line is 21 BC, this black line is 2200 BC. If you come back to uh, 27 BC, you get this line right here, which is the building of the Tower of Babel. Now, at the building of the Tower of Babel, there was a scattering, right? And uh, the, uh, immediately after, there was the scattering. And could it have been just shortly after in the uh, scattering and the development of the nations that there is this testimony that is built? Now, this makes it after the flood, uh, not before the flood. There's been some question, you know, did this, uh, did this building survive the flood? Uh, the, 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 the timing and the evidence we have seems to put it after the flood, but not long after the flood, and uh, puts it uh, right in on uh, that area. Now, let's talk about the sevens in the pyramid, and uh, there are uh, sevens again all the way through. The Grand Gallery, the Grand Gallery is, uh, let me get back to a good picture, this number nine right here is the Grand Gallery. Uh, by the way, those of you online, if you say, I can't see the picture, the Pyramid of Giza on Wikipedia. That's where this picture comes from, <laughs> uh, this particular picture. It matches so closely, in fact, I think exactly, uh, Sices in his book, uh, and it's actually better quality on Wikipedia, uh, because Sice did his in 1877 as a draftsman, uh, and we have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Uh, but this grand gallery right here uh, is uh, what, we're, uh, what we're talking about. So. Uh, the Grand Gallery is exactly seven times higher than the passageway to the gallery. The passageway is not uh, very uh, tall. Some of you have been through that. Uh, you, have to, you have to duck down, don't you? Yeah, like uh, almost hands and knees, right? And uh, so then you get uh, seven times high. I, I think it's uh, 27 feet high or something like that in the Grand Gallery, somewhere around there. The sides of the Grand Gallery have seven overlapping layers of stone, kind of like you would do, uh, uh, I don't know, a shingle roof. Uh, uh, do that in stone, 
seven layers up. These are huge stones, obviously, uh, and uh, there's seven of them. You go in the queen's chamber, which is uh, the one uh, below. Uh, here's the king's chamber here. Here's the queen's chamber right here. Uh, we'll talk about uh, that later. But uh, in the uh, queen's chamber, the uh, passage has markings on it, and it's basically divided in uh, seven, sections of seven. The... Uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's marked not only in sevenths, but almost like we talked about last night with the four plus the one on the five, those markings are six plus one, six plus one, six plus one, uh, giving us the uh, six of seven together and the seventh of seven separate. And then it, goes, it, it uh, repeats it uh, a number of times. Uh, in the seventh section, the floor is sunken so that you can tell, hey, this, se this seventh is set apart from the rest. That room has seven sides, the queen's chamber. Now, it's not all that uh, spectacular. It's just a room with a vaulted roof. You've got uh, four, five, six, seven. Uh, but no nonetheless, it is a room which, uh, again, shouts out uh, sevens. Uh, the cubic space contained in the vaulted area up there is one-seventh of the cubic space contained in the, uh, the lower uh, area of the room. So there is a seven-ness uh, to all of this. So then the question is, who is behind it all? Uh, but let me cover a couple of things on the notes before I get to that. Um, seven is embedded in nature, isn't it? Uh, the French with their revolution and trying to get rid of the measurement system. They also tried to get rid of the week, the seven-day week, uh, for a number of reasons, but the, you know, often uh, considered to be pragmatic. I would say for the same reason they wanted to get rid of the measurement system, that is, this shouts too much that there is a creator. And we, are, we bow down to philosophy. Uh, we have a liberty in and of ourselves. We don't want any fixed truth because a fixed truth would blow our whole theory out. And so the French, back again, uh, uh, these days came through the Enlightenment and the days of the French uh, Revolution, they uh, tried to do away with a seven-day week. They thought a 10-day week made more sense. And I guess in a lot of ways it does. I mean, you know, math challenged people like me, uh, you know, trying to figure out what day is it three weeks from now. Wouldn't it be easier if that was just 30 days? Uh, to figure that I could, I could do fives and I could do tens. It's sevens that give me a problem, you know. Um, I, I was 42 before I knew seven times seven was 49. Uh, but uh, these, these, seven's not really the natural number. They tried to do away with it. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, they all got sick. The productivity went way down. Uh, it just was a colossal failure. Even the French had to say, we're going back to a seven-day week. This, this doesn't make sense. And down through time, every civilization there has ever been anywhere lives on a seven-day seven -day cycle. Uh, it seems to be embedded again uh, in nature. And so even with the intense fiveness of the pyramid, there is a sevenness that gets uh, included and gets shouted uh, through, and we begin to uh, see that, and we saw some of those things there. Now, who is behind it all? This is what we want to know. And uh, uh, I wanted to see where I was. I don't have a slide for it, but I do have notes. The things that we have found here are not found in other pyramids. They're not found in all pyramids. As a matter of fact, uh, early this morning I kind of uh, woke up and I thought, uh, you know, I had pyramids on my mind. <laughs> and uh, so I was just, you know, Googling a few pyramid things. Uh, and I found this guy that was talking about uh, the, the, uh, the, the mysticism pyramid hoax. Uh, and I realized, oh, he's talking about what I'm teaching here. Uh, and he was, he was very much against it. So I thought, well, that's what I want to read. Uh, let's see what he has to say. He was from, I believe, George Washington University. Uh, and basically, uh, what's the Hebrew word? Poo-pooing? Uh, uh, Poo-pooing, uh, the, whole, the whole theory that all of this was here. And so he did studies, especially on pi and phi. 
We haven't talked about fee. The, do you all know what I'm talking about when I say that? It's the, uh, what, what do they call it? The, uh, not the magic number, the golden number. Uh, it's another ratio that is essential to the universe. Uh, and uh, we won't get into it all. It's all uh, based upon a uh, Greek number. Uh, by the way, they, uh, we always say pi, but do you know you actually pronounce it P? P and phi, if you are really Greek, but would seem weird. So we're sticking with pi, pi and phi. Uh, some, some would even say pi phi, like uh, phi alpha beta. Uh, so anyway, pi and phi, we'll go with it. Uh, pi and phi. Uh, he took these two ratios, which are essential to geometry and essential to the, to the cosmos. Uh, you can't understand the universe without those two ratios. Uh, he took those and said, I'm going to study the pyramids myself, and I'm going to prove all of this is just crazy. All of this is just a hoax. And uh, he uh, had these charts of uh, all these pyramids. I think uh, the chart I looked at was 25 pyramids that he looked at uh, and studied all the measurements. And he said, there is absolutely no consistency at all. There's not any kind of testimony of all these numbers. He said, of all of them I looked at, only one has that kind of ratio. And I thought, that's the argument. <laughs> exactly. Only one. The other pyramids don't have these ratios. Every now and then, of course, you're going to accidentally uh, stumble into one maybe in a pyramid and whatnot. But, uh, you know, all of this ratio of pi and uh, phi and, uh, uh, and the 365s and the 25,860, whatever that number is, uh, it's just not found in the, in the, other, uh, in the other pyramids. Uh, and you, you wonder, how could you originate, because everyone says the pyramid at Giza was the first one, how could you originate that idea and then not go out and duplicate it? You would think, let's build the next one just like this. But the next one right next to it is not built like that. And the other one on the other side of it is not built. And, and uh, all through the world there are pyramids, but they're not built on these same kinds of ratios. Almost as if someone could come and look at the outside and say, that's a triangle building, let's build another one. But not have the knowledge that was embedded in the first one, and so they did kind of a cheap copycat. Uh, that's not the real thing, but yeah, it is a pyramid, no doubt about it, it is a pyramid. It just doesn't have all that interior stuff and, uh, and whatnot. And uh, as, uh, as you know, uh, much of the knowledge of this sidereal years and pi and all this kind of stuff was not discovered uh, uh, enough that we could put it in our history books or our science books for hundreds or thousands of years later is when we came to, oh, well, you know, it's 365.2522 and, and uh, there's uh, 94 million miles, uh, uh, whatever the exact number is, the mean distance from the earth to the sun, all these kind of things that uh, took place again was much later and yet here it is right here. So who's behind all this? Who knows all of this? Uh, the, uh, the, the Egypt of that day, when you go back into everything that we can tell that Egypt knew that day, it didn't know this. So did the Egyptians uh, build it? You know, Herodotus, we saw his picture last night. Um, uh, Herodotus wrote about the pyramids. He wrote an origin of the pyramids. And uh, he said in his day, again, uh, 450 BC, he said that the Egyptians at that time were saying, we didn't build the pyramids. We built some other pyramids. We didn't build the pyramid at Giza. Uh, we copied that. But we didn't build the Pyramid of Giza. And they said, this is another guy. Uh, his name uh, is pronounced a little different. It looks like when you look at it uh, uh, on paper, it looks like Cheops. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the actual pronunciation of it would be Hops. Hops is who Herodotus said, this is the guy. And if you, if you look on the internet again, you can, uh, you know, if you put the Pyramid of Cheops, C-H-E-O-P-S, uh, it, it'll be the Pyramid of Giza. And that, that name again comes from Herodotus, who was talking to Egyptians, and the Egyptians were saying, some guy from the east came here and he built it. Uh, he was a king, he came, he built it. That's the uh, theory that was given. We'll add more to that later. So the pyramid is certainly in Egypt, but it's not of Egypt. I, I think even the Egyptians 
probably even to this day will tell you this is not really uh, this is not really our work uh, and uh, not uh, our design from everything we know about what the Egyptians knew in that uh, day. Now you can say, okay, maybe it was from Babylon. And the Babylonians did know a little bit more. We have in recorded history of uh, some of the scientific uh, stuff that is uh, given there. But they had uh, uh, the planet temple of Nebo at Borsippa. Uh, and it's, it's an, an ancient building as well. Uh, but it was supposed to be a planet temple, and it didn't even get the planets right. Uh, they, there's, there's so many things we would look at that today and say, ah, it's, it's as they could see it, accurate. But as it actually is, it's inaccurate. This one doesn't seem to come from the Babylonians. They don't seem to have that uh, knowledge. So who is behind it all? Who would know all of this? Hmm, I wonder. We could speculate. <laughs> uh, Seiss says, the whole thing bears the impress of an intelligence so high, a wisdom so unaccountable, and a benef be beneficence so genial toward the wants of man that no one yet has even begun to show how it can be less than supernatural. Now, of course, if you uh, watch uh, Late Night History Channel or something like this, their supernatural is going to be aliens that came in with this uh, particular information, and the aliens built it. Uh, I happen to believe it, is, uh, it does have a supernatural architect, not aliens, as in space creatures. A little bit different. But I think this is right. You, you, you can't look at all of this and say, oh, really smart Egyptians. They, they did that. I think you have to, you have, to have a better argument uh, from that. Um, now, why, why would this thing... Let me, let me back up before I get there on why Egypt. Uh, the, the pyramid is... If, if our dating is right, the pyramid is 600 years older than the Torah. Uh, so 600 years prior to Moses. Uh, could it be that... You know, in our day, we believe we have the 66 books of the Bible. It is the revelation of God. Uh, we, we do believe in general revelation. That is kind of the revelation that comes from nature and the things that you uh, learn about God through there. But it's confirmed in the Scripture, and we would say the, the, the Scripture is the sole source of our uh, authority and of our uh, practice. But they didn't have the Scripture then. They, they, they heard from God in different ways. Many times they heard from God uh, directly. Uh, so what could it have uh, been? Could the pyramid have been an earlier pre-Torah revelation of God about the universe? This is the world in which you live. Uh, and that it was built uh, really as a storehouse for that information so that mankind could come and know that information probably would have set us a few years ahead, right, had we uh, studied it uh, earlier. Uh, but we could know this uh, information and uh, begin to carry it out because there's nothing else, as we mentioned last night, the, the, uh, the pyramid is just not used, it's not good for anything else. It's only good for measurements uh, and uh, the insights that those measurements uh, give. Now, why would it be put in Egypt? Let's talk about this before we take our uh, break. And uh, there, there is, you, you kind of expect it to be in Israel, right? I mean, that's, that's God's chosen place. Why Egypt? There's a lot of Egypt that connects with the promised land and the chosen people. Just look at a few of them. Abraham was ministered to and cared for in Egypt. You remember the, uh, the setting there. Uh, Joseph served in Egypt and uh, served, uh, you know, really uh, in a very, very, very high position in Egypt. Uh, Jacob would have died save for Egypt. Basically, it, it saved the, uh, the chosen family. Egypt did. Moses was born in Egypt and out of Egypt. Uh, Egypt was vital to Israel's history. Her history couldn't be told without Egypt. Sometimes good, sometimes bad, but Egypt is a part of it. Uh, and then finally, Jesus himself even fled to Egypt. Well, it doesn't really totally answer the question of why Egypt, uh, except that um, uh, it, 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 it would not be unusual to use Egypt. It'd be a little more unusual if it was, say, China. Uh, but it's not in China. It's in Egypt. And Egypt is a place that does 
tie together and coincide a little bit, uh, I think uh, quite a bit, a lot, uh, with the nation of Israel. So much that you could not tell the nation of Israel's history without bringing Egypt into it. All the way through, Egypt is, uh, you know, just right there, they're woven together, and will be really all the way into, uh, in, into uh, the final days, as we see when we read uh, prophecy. Well, with that, uh, let's uh, take a uh, little bit of a break, and uh, when we come back, we are actually going to get into some Scripture. How's that? And we're going to see, does the Scripture give any kind of testimony uh, of, um, of knowing about this? If the scripture came later, pyramid was already there, pyramid had this embedded in it, is there even a hint that the, that the scripture or the scripture writers knew about it? That's what we will look at. And uh, let's see, it's about 10.25 according to that clock, and we'll, uh, we'll break till 10.35. Uh, How does that sound? Um, so, stand up, stretch, find the bathroom, get the coffee, whatever it is. God bless you. Those online will uh, stop this and start a new broadcast. <laughs> 